I'm Magen. We don't do just crisis mapping. We do sort of more general information and knowledge management uh, for conflict transformation and strategic planning. Um, and this is focused more on the recovery and development side of things rather than on the humanitarian side. Um, having said that, Sudan is one of those countries where humanitarian responses, recovery programming, ongoing security challenges and governance deficits are sort of next to each other and intermittent um, wherever you go. It's also a country where there are three different peace agreements, um, over $9 billion pledged for recovery and reconstruction. We have the two largest peacekeeping missions in the world. Every UN agency, so to speak, is there. And, I mean, I've written a thousand NGOs. I checked the list, it's actually over 2,000 NGOs. So it's, it's quite a confusing, <laughs> overwhelming um, environment to work in. And our project came out of the need for information to do evidence-based and conflict-sensitive programming. Um, first in the sort of community security sector, and then now more general. Um, our project has mainly five sort of different stages. We started off two years ago with USB sticks running around to every actor, NGO, UN, government, I mean, line ministries, institutions, and so on, collecting data sets, asking if we could copy studies, reports, statistics, and so on. And on top of that, we rolled out a participatory mapping cycle at state and community level on sort of community perceptions of threats and risks and challenges in those communities and in their um, areas when looking towards recovery and development. I mean, the methodology I'm sure you're aware of was to sort of try to categorize the overwhelming um, risks and challenges and actors and threats and incidents that were going on, map them geographically, give them a georeference, and then try to analyze and evaluate and find ways to, to respond to them. Alongside that, one of our other aims is to enhance information management and coordination amongst actors both at national and international level. What, how we did that, or how we're trying to do that, is we've established the first of its kind at country level, an information management working group. This, at the moment, consists of most of the core UN agencies there that have, shared, um, that have signed information sharing protocols. Um, we're now expanding it to the two peacekeeping missions, and we're working on including also the NGOs. Um, what we've done to help these partners that we work with, both national and international, is that we've developed a database with four different interfaces. Um, these are all GIS enabled, and I'll show you a little bit about them later. But they're basically, depending on which sector you're working in or what topic you're working on, we have the four Ws, which is who does what, where and when, um, which is sort of project information tracking. Um, there's the crisis and recovery mapper, which goes on the community perceptions of threats and risks and challenges. Um, and there's a services and infrastructure database, which goes on basic services, trying to track functionality, status, resources available, um, coverage, and so on. And this is meant mostly for, for line ministries, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, um, and so on. And then lastly, there's the incident and events database, which goes on security-related uh, data. This is for UNDSS, um, police departments, um, justice and rule of law sectors, and so on. Um, just each of these databases can be customized to the partners, depending on their need. Um, the interface, the working interface is all, or the, the elements of each of the interfaces are all pretty much the same. This is the who does what, where, and when. So you have the elements up on the, on the what is it? Right? Right-hand corner. Um, and you have the list of actors and institutions that you can add whatever new actor or institution you have, and you fill in basically your information that you want to track in the, in the working matrix. Um, when you've selected, you can select these layers of information, and you can move directly to the map and you automatically get all that information mapped out in the state where you're working. 
You also have a layers list on the left-hand side where you can import data layers from all the other interfaces. So if you want to see who does what in the food security sector, you could also include threats and risk layers related to livelihoods or market data related to where the markets are, where schools are, where hospitals are, and so on and so forth. And then you could do basic um, statistical analysis, or basic statistics. Um, so that's sort of more or less the tool. I mean, I have them all on my computer if you want to have a look at them later. Um, just to show you a little bit of what we have done, um, we can map areas of insecurity in Darfur based on the security, um, the incident and events. You could do buffer zones around these. Um, and from that, you can then make your own security evaluations of where the safe areas or no-go areas or areas of priority are. Um, you could do geographic targeting of war-affected communities. What we've done here is we've done buffers around presence of mines um, in eastern Sudan, which basically means that we've marked out an area along the border. Um, and then we see how that interrelates with rule of law issues, which are the yellow triangles, and livelihoods issues, which are the grey triangles. This has been very useful in a context where uh, the government has consistently ignored these areas and marginalized them, um, yet still in the peace agreement it says the recovery of war-affected communities is one of their main priorities. We can do environmental mapping, um, how threats or perceptions of threats and risks related to the environment interact with desert encroachment. This is something we've taken from satellite imagery um, and then land cover and um, agricultural schemes. Um, we can do basic service mapping, um, see how if you look at just the coverage of, of health facilities in a state, it could appear that the, that the, that the coverage is quite good. However, if you look at the uh, threats and risks, it turns out that actually most of the rural um, facilities are non-functioning. There's no staff, there are no medicines, um, or it's just dilapidated. Any questions, um, please come and find me. I'd love to talk to you. <laughs>